Whiting Farms was started in 1989. And it's not just about me, although I founded it, it's a lot of other people that have contributed to the history of it and making it what it is today. Whiting Farms has been in business now for 28 years. I actually incorporated in 1989, right after I finished my doctorate in poultry genetics at the University of Arkansas. And uh, while there, I, had, I learned about a thing called fly fishing and fly tying, and I actually had a different business idea entirely, so I contacted a uh, fellow that had a hatchery or some incubators, and I asked him could I rent his hatchery or buy his incubators from him, but he said, no, but I'll sell you my hackle company. And uh, they actually had only barely gotten started in the hackle business, were just getting off the ground, and then they had a major disaster where their incubator dumped all their eggs. In hindsight, it didn't make much sense that they'd killed off their breeding stock before they hatched their next successive generation, but they went on and sued the incubator company for this fault of the machinery, and they, I guess they settled on the courthouse uh, steps. But my introduction and education in the haggle business started off with a stack of legal documents about a foot and a half high. That was their preparation for the trial. And literally, the guy just kind of pitched it across the table to me and said, here you go. And so I took that back with me to graduate school and poured through the whole thing. And in there, I heard things such as Hoffman Hackle and Hebert Hackle and Metz, of course. And that was my introduction. bought the original Hoffman Hackle line from Henry Hoffman in Oregon, and that was my foundation stock. I also wanted to buy the Hebert Hackle line, which was available at the same time, but I couldn't afford both, so I opted with the higher quality of the two. The strong point of that was it had a dry fly saddle at that time, unique, and it had the highest quality hackle, but it was limited to most, mostly grizzly. I have to credit just good timing, because about this time, there was a lot of new interest in fly fishing by what we referred to as the yuppies back then, who wanted to get into fly fishing because the movie A River Runs Through It had come through it out, and that inspired a lot of people wanting to do it because it was a great film. Uh, that's one of the reasons Whiting Farm is here. Very good luck, and a lot of people caring for us and wanting to help us out. from the Denver area, the big city in Colorado, but I wanted to come out where it was more pastoral and less crowded and whatnot. So I ended up starting at a little facility in Fruta, Colorado. It was actually a foreclosed on seed warehouse facility and I thought I could raise roosters there. And uh, without going into too much agonizing detail, it was a pretty bad failure the first year. Most of the birds were not very good. So one of the fellows I met there who was a mink farmer and was taking the carcasses from the harvest, said, well, why don't you go down and talk to the guys in Delta? There's a bunch of mink farms down there and they're going out of business. And uh, so I needed cages, that's what I didn't have. So mink farms are nothing but cages. So I went down and met an elderly gentleman who was walking around in a walker and had a f three f mink facilities. And uh, he took a chance on me because the market for mink was pretty well going away at that time. And uh, I subsequently moved my operations from Fruta, Colorado to Delta, Colorado, bought one of the studio fur farms first. They moved the mink out, and we moved the roosters in. So it was very great serendipity that I ended up in a place where there was people with expertise about how to raise an animal with something of high value on the outside that's gotta be kept in a cage by itself. And so as we grew and did more and more birds and expanded as fast as we and sometimes couldn't manage, uh, we always um, try to evolve and improve things, not only genetically improving the birds, but improving the system. So I think we do things radically different than anyone else does, and the fact we go year-round is something that none of them do. We have two production on two different separate ranches. Currently we have 22 sheds in the system, a state-of-the-art hatchery, and one important factor of it, and it's the only way I can imagine a hackle company could work, is that you have to be vertically integrated, completely integrated. So we own the pedigree lines, the genetic lines, they're proprietary, we have breeders, I do a lot of work in selecting the breeders, then they are put in production, we raise the baby chicks uh, in our own system, under our own program, and we really pamper them, because I've learned these hackle lines are highly inbred, 
very susceptible to stress, they have to be basically pampered. Otherwise, they won't achieve the genetic potential they have. And I think we've been innovative in how we do it. We wash all our own pelts, all of them. We dry them a certain way. We have our own expert dyeing. We package them, and we grade them in our own system. And right now, we have 23 full-time employees and a few part-time employees that are working for that purpose year-round to try to fill the, the demand for our product. But we also supply to many fly tying companies who even though when I got into this business wanted to buy the low end, the commercial grade, now they buy our high end because they realize the cost per fly is less if they buy the higher grades because there's more value in that. I work for Tom uh, because I love fly fishing. This is my passion. And I believe that Tom Whiting has the largest impact on fly tying than anybody has ever in the world. The advances that he has made just in feathers, nothing can be matched. There's, there's no one person that has made this kind of contribution. I, th I think it's amazing what he does, and uh, I'm very proud to work here because of that. We know that our products are good because people scream at us for it, and uh, we understand why. And they refuse to buy other products, and we also understand why. Um, the, the time and effort that Tom has put into this company, each, each lineage, I mean, it's just phenomenal. The only time he takes a day off is when his wife tells him to take a day off. <laughs> uh, some folks call me the Fly Ninja, and I am very, very fortunate to spend some time here at Whiting Farms grading saddles and playing with feathers such as this all day long and, and uh, I get paid for it. So it's a wonderful job, it's a wonderful life. I had the guidance of Henry Hoffman on one hand and Ted Hebert, but they had their systems and I had to evolve my own. But what I found, my nature is I like it. I just like looking at all the birds. And it's fun to kind of realize where they came from, where they are now and where you want to take them. And I found that infinitely enjoyable. And it's not easy. The gen uh, genesis of the spay hackle, fly tires came to me and said, well, we need this feather. And I looked around at different options on how to do it, and I came up with a couple, and I, one of them has worked out rather well. It took 10 years to form it into a sellable product, but now in the last 10 years, it's basically exploded, and we can't even keep up with it. And now standard patterns are using that feather and even fly tying companies are ordering it because people are ordering the flies that they require that material specifically. And then the dry fly lines, which are really the backbone of the whole operation, they are very complex to breed. You're, all the different characteristics, the barb density, the rachis, how well it turns, with its proper size and elasticity, the colors are pretty easy. People think that the colors are just the difficult part. They're actually the easy part. It's the quality and the refinement of those. I literally count barbs, I literally count feathers. So I feel really humbly grateful that I have the opportunity to do this for the fly tires of the world. Even though I'm not a fly fisherman or fly tire, my passion is birds. And now that I look at it, if I step back and look at it, the challenges are not fly tying and fly fishing in this business. They're really poultry genetics, poultry production, small business management, and uh, time management. And in a way, I think it's almost a benefit that I'm not a fly tire or a fly fisherman. I know how to do them both, but I don't find a passion in them. It's because I'm objective and I have people in my staff and in the fly tying community and our pro team that keep me lined out and tell me, give me ideas, tell me when things need to be changed or offer suggestion or product ideas. That's my idea of fun. Uh, the type of genetics that really create these fly tying lines are what I refer to or geneticists would refer to as qualitative and quantitative genetics. And qualitative genetics means certain things that are qualitative traits such as color or feather features or shape and things like that. Quantitative genetics is about populations where you have a herd of animals and you select from within that herd and you direct the genetic development of that herd from within a population. And that's where selection pressures and heterability, 
heritability and things like that really come into play. The one thing we haven't done is what is referred to now as biochemical genetics, where they take DNA and RNA and all the components that are part of the genome and manipulate them. We don't do that. All of my selection is based on physical characteristics and population characteristics. The one I did not create from scratch was the Coq de Leon from Spain, which is one of my favorite birds. And that's the oldest that anyone knows about, genetic hackle or fly tying feather bird. And it goes back at least 500 years documents. And I imported some of those in the early 90s with the help of a friend. And I've enjoyed them immensely. They're a beautiful, noble, dignified, got a lot of class. I just love those birds. We don't do anything like beak trimming or any treatments to them that are in any way deleterious to them. We have had no disease problems since the very early sort of incompetent days. We never feed antibiotics. I'm a very big believer in probiotics. I have a four-prong program that people even interview me about because it seems to work so well. We haven't had any uh, disease problems ever in the company. Their succession plan. <laughs> you're on the stage and you're, yeah. <laughs> I always thought, you know, in, in, in a funny way, it was, you know, hit a nail in the head. You know, because I am now 60 years old and I've maybe got a few good years left in me, but, you know, I have to think about where these lines are going to be, who's going to take them over. Like in the case of the Hebrew Minor, I'm the fourth custodian of this line. You know, it started with Harry Darby and Andy Miner and Ted Hebert, now me, who is it gonna go after that? And the one thing I've understood after doing this so many years is a very, it's a long-term commitment. It's incremental, it's slow moving, and I really want Whiting Farms to go on after me so these can be passed on. I have had opportunity to sell the company, but I don't really want to do that. I would rather have the uh, ethic about what we're doing here to carry on, because a lot of these lines, that a lot of people have put a lot of work into them, and I want to see them carried on and even improved. So what I'm planning on doing, there, I've got a few young people in the company or in graduate school right now who have expressed the desire to carry on my work, and they work here intermittently to see what it's like so they know what they're getting into, I hope, and they're willing to make that commitment to carry it on because I have some other business ideas or bird ideas or product ideas, and I hope they have more product ideas. It's a dynamic system, and uh, you, are, you really have to want to do it or people want to have to do it. And they have to have the intellectual curiosity about the, the plan and the program, not just to make money. They got to be here because they want to do it. They got to have some sense of pride and and uh, taking it beyond it.